All right, what's up, everybody? Oh, everybody. <laughs> what's up, what's up, everybody? Yeah. All right, uh, what's, what's up? To, uh, another section of our Let's Talk Live. As you already know, today we're about to talk about, say, Africa, you know, in general, about our country, where we're from. And um, the questions that we had today was uh, if Africa could unite and also if um, Africans from the diaspora could actually move home to build the continent of Africa. And the reason why I'm just going to give a little brief uh, summary as to why I chose these particular people, everybody that's watching me, so we have uh, Wadimaya here. He's kind of like has traveled, I would say, through most of the African countries. Uh, yeah, he's my brother. He's traveled most, you know, most of the African countries, I would say. We have Ms. Drew, who uh, was born and raised in the uh, UK, and then she moved to Ghana. You know, to, I would say, keep going with her life. She's, you know, doing wonderful over there. And then we have my controversial brother, uh, Darlington here. He's a controversial politician. <laughs> if you hit him with politics, he, he always has an answer for you. So these are the reasons why I chose those specific people because everybody has a little bit of idea about, you know, a little sector of everything. So to make it a lot easier for us to actually dissect the topic a lot more. So the one, the first thing, the first thing that I'm actually going to talk about is um, the first topic that we have, which is um, can Africa unite, you know? And uh, I'm just going to give the reason why I chose that topic because when you look at most of the things that's actually going on right now, when you look at it, uh, most of the things that's going on, let's say with uh, the NSARS, everything going on in Ivory Coast and stuff like that, it's not at first, right? You would see that it's more so about, let's say, the white man actually, uh, you know, ruling over Africans, the white man t telling us what to do and stuff like that. But now it's more so about Africans fighting against Africans, if you get my point. Africans not trying to see each other prosper. Africans not trying to actually make sure that our country is what we want it to be, if you get my point. So, Per your experiences and per you know your knowledge about uh, what you've seen and what you've heard, I'm just going to start off with Ms. Drew because, ladies first, you move in, you know, you've been raised in the UK and then you move into Ghana. What has been some of your experiences moving to Ghana and some things that you you think could actually be done better and uh, you know things that we could improve on outside back home in Ghana? Okay, um, firstly, hi, hi everybody, everybody watching. My name is Drew. I am a presenter and YouTuber. Yes. I do lots of other things, but um, okay. I don't think I'll be able to really touch much on other different countries around Africa. I can only talk about my experience in Ghana and how I feel. Definitely, Ghanaians in Ghana do definitely need to support each other. I feel in Ghana, there's a lot of pulling people down type of okay. notion mentality that we have here. I mean, it's very from my experience coming up here when it comes to support. The support that you get from other people is a little bit, it's not what you would expect if you were from the UK. Okay. And if from people in the same sector as I am, let's say presenting, event hosting, there are quite a few people that will happily, you know, share your posts or, you know, tell people to come and watch you. Or even if you're like, you know, right now we have this support black businesses thing that's mm -hmm. going on yeah. after Black Lives Matter. And so there was a lot of, you know, yeah, let's help each other, let's support our own, let's bring, let's lift each other up. Coming to Ghana, it was a little bit difficult, different for me because a lot of people are thinking, oh, this lady, she's come from the UK. Like, it wasn't about my talent. It was, who does this girl think she is? And what does she think she's gonna come here and do? Yeah. Um, a lot of this, I was getting a lot, you know, firstly, a lot of people are just like, why would you come here? You're from the UK. Why would you leave your paradise to come here? Not a lot of people were wanting to support the fact that, okay, I'm here, help me, you know, navigate my way around. Okay. Um, again, the the Ghanaians, I would say, I can only talk about females, a lot of bitchiness around. And, um, you know, one person is doing something, they don't want to see you prosper, jealousy. So people will say things to bring you down. People will say things, you know, just they'll make like passing comments that can affect your the way you look to somebody else and automatically 
you've got about Chinese whispered spreads like wildfire. You mm -hmm. have about five people that have a person have an idea about you, yet they've never met you before. Exactly. And so exactly. When it came to supporting, you know, a new person who's come onto the scene and helping her connect with your links, people mm -hmm. seem to be very. Oh, whether we, I don't want to, I don't know if the word is stingy with their networks or stingy with their connections. Everybody is just trying to focus on themselves instead of working together. Yeah. When I'm sure together we'd be able to go much further. They, they, I think they have the saying in Ghana that uh, every man for himself, God for us all. <laughs> so if I show you my network, you're probably going to overtake me. There you go. That's legit. Like, that is that, that, that's true. That's true. We'll move on to uh, the, the main man, uh, Mr. Wadimaya. You know, you, you, you traveling across Africa, I would say, what has been some of your experiences? Uh, recently, I saw you made a video about um, uh, you being in Kenya for about five, the fifth time you've been in Kenya and the fact that whenever you get there, you're racially profiled, you know, to be this guy who is coming in and have, you know, any person coming to Kenya or whatever the case may be. So tell us about your experiences actually traveling around Africa and some of uh, the things you think we could do better, or I would say Africans, quote unquote, could do better to help unite us as one. I do know that, you know, in life you do need people, right? As uh, as long as we're humans, we black would need the white, the black would need the Caucasians, the white, would need, you know, we need each other. But then again, Specifically in Africa, there is so much of this, uh, what do we call it, pull him down, pull him down spirit. Sorry, yeah. pull him down spirit, where we say every man for himself, God for us. So, so <laughs> what has been some of your experiences? What do you think we could do better to actually help us in general and this, our future generation that's actually coming up to help us unite? I just feel like, you know, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me over here. And um, I'm seeing great panels today. And I just want to say a big shout out to each and every one of you in here. Um, can Africa unite? Definitely it's happening, you know, um, with the power of social media. Mm -hmm. um, the youth are waking up already. But, you know, like when the youth are waking up and we have people in power who really don't care about us, is the um, people living in the continent that really suffers. Talking about my experiences in Africa, traveling in Africa, it's, it has been good so far because I've learned a lot, but um, despite being good, there's a lot of struggle traveling within Africa. Um, I don't even want to say this, but let me tell you something like, Africans don't even believe that as an African, you have to get money to travel within your own continent. <laughs> wow. That's the, that's, that's the first thing I, um, whenever they see, they feel like you're getting the money from somewhere. And I'm that guy who um, don't want to show off for people to know what I have in my bag or whatever. Like, I mean, I, I like being simple wherever I go to. Mm -hmm. And immediately I get there, they check your passport. They feel like, oh, you're a drug dealer or something like that. And they yeah. start harassing you. Um, yeah. It has not been in one country, so many countries, so many yeah. African countries. I've been deported. I've been arrested. I've been, wow. you know treated as if I'm not even an African. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that I've lived abroad and I know how it feels like being an African abroad and coming back to Africa and your own people treat you this way, it's so sad. I get so mad that sometimes I feel like I want to boil and bust at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, but it's all good. It, I just feel like it's part of um, decolonizing our mindset because like most of us, I, I would say that Africa is still not free. We still colonize because, you know, they colonize us for like, like we, 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 we were enslaved and at the same time colonized. So bringing Africans out of this whole colonization mindset is going to be something difficult to crack. But yeah. uh, trying our best, I just feel like social media is helping a lot. Um, yeah. at this very moment, like I said, I didn't know Drew anywhere, uh, but through social media, we managed to connect. So that's yeah. that how I see us uniting, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, for Africa Unite, I know definitely someday it will happen, but not in any time soon. Okay, got you. <laughs> what do you think, Darlington? Um, can Africa Unite? Um, my take before before I I, I, I I jump into that, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And first of all, networking with this um, lovely people, Drew and Wademaya. And um, again, my name is Darlington. I'm an outreach and talent development manager. Um, I'll say one thing. Um, Okujata said that he said, people sleep with their heads in Togo and their feet in Ghana. We're yeah. one people. Uh, when you go to the Ewa area, 
and um, Volta region area. We are one people. We tend to be the same people. We have like the similar culture. The whole Jollof war thing. Jollof is across the entire West African um, terrain. Mm -hmm. um, but can Africa unite? Currently, I cannot say yes. Mm -hmm. I want it to be yes, but I cannot say yes. Okay. Reasons being, it's very political. Yeah. Um, during our early stages of independence, during our early stages of independence, it was something that our leaders at that time were pushing for. There were leaders that pushed for it. Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Kuma mentioned that there were leaders that really pushed for um, a united front. Yeah. But because we did not allow it then, it is going to be very difficult for us to do that because now each and every country within the African continent has experienced power, yeah. being independent on our own, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Let's use the answer situation that happened in Nigeria. Yeah. And the whole fact that Nanado, the president of the current president of Ghana, should intervene, make a statement. We have celebrities going online say, why is the president not making statement? Why is the president making statement about George Floyd in the US and not talking about and says, but you and, and the and the statement that he's the chairman of ECOWAS. It doesn't work that way. There are a lot of international relationship going on, and you can't just come out and make a statement just like that. Yes, he can express how he feels. But he can't make a statement based on his position as one president and also the chairman of ECOWAS. So, mm -hmm. in terms of African uniting, we as a people, in terms of culture, by music, our entertainment, we're united. We are building something. But politically, I am. I can't say we are ready. Maybe the future generation, but now we're not. That's my take on it. We, yeah. the, the, the fact that we don't have Pan African leaders, that's why Africa is struggling with the mm -hmm. likes of Carmen Kruma and yeah, 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 um, I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. Currently, Africa doesn't have we don't. Pan African leaders. You, you cannot tell me that something is happening in Nigeria and Akufado cannot talk about it. It's mm -hmm. because they're all best of the same feathers. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening. Look at, I, look I, at what I, is happening. Look at what is happening in Ivory Coast. Yeah. No, no African leader is talking about it. How can a whole president win a hundred percent vote? Yeah. Which where does it happen? So the issue, the issue the issue right now is that um I mean we all have the same, we're all Ghanaians, you one owner your piano. Mm -hmm. Um the point is if the people yeah. push for it and it gets to a certain point where international folks have to get in or world leaders have to get in world music leaders can get in but till then it is very difficult for us to jump in it's because it international relations it's because mm -hmm. africans are not ready to solve their own problems that that is that is the main reason we always think that every problem must have solution from the west which is not possible because the west doesn't care about you if they care about you, they won't, they, won't, they won't enslave you. If they care about you, they won't colonize you. This mm -hmm. is what African leaders must understand. Look at them. All of them are congratulating Trump, uh, what do you call it? Joe Biden for winning election. But mm -hmm. there is war in Ethiopia. No one is talking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't even get it. Like, yo, yeah. um, we quality. are saying that if Africa ever unite. Yeah. Listen, as far as we have leaders like this in power, it will yeah. never happen. Okay. Okay. See, that draws me to my next question, though. You know, we're talking about how uh, uh, Newman, uh, Darlington, you're talking about, like, you know, uh, Kufado, you know, given the state. My father name is Newman, so if you mention it. My father name is Newman, sorry. It draws to my next question, right? How, uh, what Amaya was saying, that uh, in Africa, everything that we do over there, we're always trying to look up to the West to see, you know, exactly. what they can do to intervene in outside. So with that said, do you think that us as Africans are still mentally still being enslaved by ideologies from the west thank you we're still enslaved yeah Fast. i i mean um, okay now we have the politician uh-huh what, what the idea the idea of democracy is from the west okay and we have taken it wholeheartedly if okay. we want to keep democracy then we have to come to the understanding that i wouldn't say we are enslaved it is it is more so of um, an ideology that we are taking and, and, and experimenting it to see if it'll work when you look into history Mm -hmm. There are a lot of like country, even the West took a lot of knowledge from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They took knowledge from the Middle East and they developed it to make it um, good for them. Okay. It is the same. I think we have to take the best from the West and make it better for ourselves mm -hmm. and make sure it works for our system.
Okay. Not what? just only following it blindly. And um, a lot of countries what? are doing that. Civilization started of... from Africa. Exactly. And and and, and you, so, can, you can like when you look at the, um, the Romans and uh, when they came to Egypt, Alexander, they took books from there, they studied books from there. So it's 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 more so also we going back and also learning from them. There's nothing wrong in learning from them. It's about taking what is working there mm -hmm. and can work for us. It's not just working there, but can only work for us also and applying mm -hmm. it in our system and making it work. Um, not, not to cut you off, you know how you were talking, uh, you know, the explanation that you're giving right now. That's why I would say I have Ms. Drew on because judging from the fact that, you know, she came from the UK over to Ghana, right? She came from the West, I would say, and then moved to Ghana, right? So when you, uh, this question goes to you, Ms. Drew, when you move to Ghana, you know, in the UK or I'll say in the States or in the Western world, right? We work with time. You have to be on time. Everything has to be on time. Your work has to be done this way. This has to be done that way. It keeps you going, keeps the money flowing. Have you ever been in that situation? Let's say when you started being a presenter and stuff like that, right? Whereas they tell you to get here on time or people in the same, I'll say, industry as you actually trying to learn something from the experiences that you've had being in the worst and moving to Ghana? Or do they feel like, oh, you're this lady who wants to come in, oh, you're always trying to do, they don't want to learn from what you've learned to actually help improve them. Have you ever been in that situation before? Most definitely. Like I was agreeing with Darlington when he was talking about taking ideas from the West and applying them to, you know, how we do things in Africa. I'm not saying that the West is perfect, of course not, but at least taking some things from there and making it work for our good again yes like exactly like you said i've come from you know an area where if you say five o'clock it's five o'clock if you arrive at 505 there's a possibility your appointment is cancelled mm -hmm. but in ghana you'll have a meeting at three o'clock the person will roll up at six and they'll tell you oh but i'm here now which i'm like wow it's a little bit disrespectful when it comes to you know respecting people's time and doing things i definitely do feel like in I can't speak for Africa because I'm having I'm not in I don't know Africa, but for mm -hmm. Ghana, I would say at some times it is necessary to have some form of structure. Yeah. Structure would kind of help. If there was a little bit of structure, it would help make it make help us to be able to move forward a little bit, it would have a little mm -hmm. bit more order, it would maybe make things move a little bit more seam seamlessly. But then okay. again, when you come, when I've come, it's been like, listen, you're in Ghana now, this is how we do things in Ghana, and you just have to adapt. To the way they do things that's and so it is frustrating because weirdly as frustrating as it is it does in a way work out and so you have to learn to do things the way you do things and it does get done it does get done just longer than you know if i had planned to do this in london if yeah. it will be done a bit more a bit more quicker gotcha yeah it, it, it draws some, uh you know um since uh what well, has had a lot of interviews in ghana you know interviewing people like real estate in, uh, investors and stuff like that you know, normally they uh, you give them a time as to when you're gonna be there, right? So let's say they you, they tell you to come interview them, they tell you five o'clock. Let's say you get there at five o'clock on the dot. Have you ever Maya. been where you get there at let's say one and the person is not even there? And you know, when yeah, they you know, like let, let me tell you something. Um, like in Ghana, yeah, there's nothing like two o'clock has to be two o'clock. Yes, okay. My skin, skin, skin. I, I mean, like I, I have been a victim myself. Like, okay, when I was based in China, I used to, like, when I came back to Africa, I was, like, I, I was respecting time all the time. Like, if you tell me 1 o'clock, I'll be there, like, 12 o'clock, and then I'll wait, like, let's say three hours before the person shows up. Yeah. And I felt like, yo, I'm in Rome right now, so I need to roll, like, people in Rome do, you know? So I had to go with the flow because... This is the situation. Like you, you cannot tell me to come at twelve o'clock and I get there at twelve o'clock and I have to wait for three hours. I'd rather wait in my house for three hours and come yeah. and you know, meet it. But it's it's a system in but Ghana. Then, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it has to change. It yeah. has to Man, change. But we are all used to it. Change. Okay. It has to change. But, but you know what? We need to get unused. We need to get what, unused. What am I? I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you're saying that yeah. when you go to Rome, you do what the Romans do. It's, it's a culture thing, and which is wrong. This culture thing needs to change. Very wrong. The point is, if you if you make a change, and like, if let's say I have a meeting with you, I'm supposed to have a meeting with you, and it's supposed to be at three, and you come at six, obviously, I will make sure you're not seeing me by six. You're not going to see me, because I'm going to give you like 30 minutes. And if we start doing that, people will start adapting also. It's, it's little mm -hmm. drops of water makes a mighty ocean. You okay. doing it, me doing it, the next person doing it, and changes okay. It's just, it's more sort of a culture thing. It's, 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 it's us doing it little by little and it will change the culture. 
very, okay. very lax and very blase, sure. you know, which is yeah. it can be frustrating. But again, like what the Maya said, you had you just have to actually deal with it. And mm -hmm. sometimes you when when but I've definitely had so many experiences where I've been like, if you're not here by 30 minutes, I'm going. Then they start getting upset with you. Like, oh, you just need to relax, relax. Yeah. This is funny. You need to, you need to calm down, calm down. And then it's just like, well, you know, if you know that you actually need to have this meeting with this person, there's nothing you can do about it. But you just actually sadly have yeah. to wait. You just have to wait, which is just it's very annoying. But I would say some of the mentality from the West definitely needs to be. That's why I would like more of the diaspora to come to Ghana to be able to sort these things out, own businesses or do customer service, you know, sessions to teach people how mm -hmm. to behave, how to have a good customer service. And when they see more people are going around like that and that they are prospering, that mm -hmm. way is when other people will copy or you'll get the people that will then drag them down because that's what happens. But people are doing such amazing, people in Ghana will be like, oh, they'll start talking bad about it. And it will just be pulling a pulling down, pulling down system. Yeah. So yeah. even though I've come back to Ghana, I love Ghana. I mean, Ghana is my home, but my mind isn't, I'm coming here to change Ghana. Drew is trying to be international. So mm -hmm. I can get the Ghana market, but I'm still trying to get other people because it is sadly very, very difficult. Very, very yeah. difficult. And it, it does draw to my next question that we had on the list as to if um, Africans in the diaspora to actually move back home to actually help build the continent of Africa. And, uh, you know, normally I touch base on this because, and I have examples that I use, let's say uh, with Darlington, right? Let's say with Darlington and I being in the States, right? Let's say we work and we get paid, let's say a month. I'm just giving an example. Let's say a month we get paid, let's say $6,000, right? Which in Ghana is like 30,000 cities or something like that, right? We get paid $6,000 uh, here and we get to Ghana we, with the intention, right? Of actually helping, you know, the society over there to help them actually improve on their work ethics, the time management, uh, um, making sure that everything is going in as seamlessly as possible. But then we get there, let's say, I would say, ah, let me say this in three, I think it goes better. Like if I get to Ghana, I'm getting paid here $6,000 a month. If I get um, they pay me answer, can, I, can I answer this question? Can I answer this question? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I would say that, as a diaspora, don't come to Africa or don't come to Ghana to look for a job. Mm -hmm. come. Listen, I, I, I was based in China, mm -hmm. and I was like, let me tell you something. I was earning like two thousand five hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. bro. I converted two thousand five hundred dollars into Ghana city. That was a lot of money. Yeah, I was yeah. so excited knowing that. Oh my goodness, I've made it to life. I was telling my mom, hey. I made it, man. Tell me what you need and I'll buy it for you. Okay. Like, that was the whole perception that I had that, like, okay, if you convert the money into Ghana cities, that's a lot of money. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need anybody. I'll, I, I'll be able to do whatever I want. Until I got to Africa mm -hmm. and I was seeing so many opportunities. I was seeing so many opportunities that, okay, when Africans on the continent see it, they'll be like, okay, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. I, you mean I can do that? Because here, Everybody is concentrating on how to get a white color job, mm -hmm. which is not paying. Terrible. Somebody might be in the bank and will be earning thousand two hundred dollars, a thousand two hundred Ghana city, and he thinks that he has made it. But let me tell you something: entrepreneurship in Africa should be encouraged because that is the key. I don't want to. I don't want to say so many things in here, but <laughs> entrepreneurship. When I came to Africa, yeah. I saw so many opportunities, bro. Like, I have, like, multiple streams of mm -hmm. income. That it's all coming from the continent. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many because I created something for myself. Yeah. I realized that so many of us, like, we just went to school because we want to be doctors, engineers, we want to sit in the offices, and we go blind about what is surrounding us. I met, mm -hmm. I interviewed a young guy today who is a radio personality here in Kenya. And being a radio personality, you know what he did? He opened a car wash. Yeah. A car wash, just an ordinary car wash. And this car wash, you know, like some of us, if you tell somebody that, oh, I own a car wash, ah, I wait, Jimmy, and a car wash now, you know. But yeah. this guy is making five times the money he makes as a radio presenter. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't believe it. So he, he took me to his uh, workplace today. I was just sitting down there, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, cars were coming in and out. Cars were coming, and he asked me, "My, are you counting? Are you counting yeah. the car? I want you to count." I kept on counting. This one goes and come. And I'm like, "Wow!" Yep. Hmm. Definitely. 
Is it? Wow. Yeah, I am not, people, not, people not selling serious. food on the streets. We don't respect them. We, yeah. we think that oh, and I will watch it two CD. No, I don't know, man. But these mm -hmm. people are telling not, me. Not, 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 mm -hmm. not, to, not yeah. to cut you off. I am no, so. Earlier this year, I was in. I was in. There's this app that people were on. Um, I think it's called um, Clubhouse or something. Party House, or something. One of those. House <laughs> Party. Yeah. So, um, my friends put me on, and I I got to network with this young guy, and and he used to work in Parliament House, and he used to work hmm. in Parliament House, and he was making about I think um, what. Five five hundred to five thousand Ghana cities. I don't know which how, how much it was, but and then he started doing a dispatch thing. He had his own motorbikes and he had riders. And he said he was sitting out doing the calculation, and the amount of money he would pay his dispatchers was equivalent on from being uh, from working the town. This connection seems to be a little bit from working at Parliament House. So mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, from working at Parliament House. So he had to actually stop working at Parliament House to focus on his own business. And his numbers were making sense that his dad decided to invest in his business. That is... Because because the thing is... So what is this app, app, just go uh, to app that you're making reference Get out of school and look for a government job or a job in the bank. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hello? He's talking I think about I'm lagging. His... And people are conditioned yeah. to go to school, get a good job, and come out and probably get a job, probably get a job in, in government or probably a bank. But then mm -hmm. we have to go beyond the box. We have to experiment outside of the box. And as um, um, Maya said, entrepreneurship, it makes sense, yeah. man. We need Let to me. start start them doing our own businesses. That is the only way they can develop exactly. the country. Exactly. More African youths must get involved i feel like somebody needs to educate us about the kind of mindset that we have the way we think the way we don't respect certain kind of jobs like i've been a victim like i i always wanted to be an engineer ah, my, my brother was the one who was telling me that oh um let's do let's be an entrepreneur I was like ah bro which one is entrepreneurship you know i just want to get paid and go my way but when i started it like I've like I've invested in so many things that like at the end of the month my YouTube comes I have other things around that comes like literally don't do anything yeah. you, 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 and 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 we are living we are living in a technological age that you can actually assess everything on your phone do everything on your phone but I'm going anywhere yeah so I feel like we need to educate more people about entrepreneurship because most of us don't understand. Like I, I went home and I'm seeing all my classmates asking me, hey, now we've seen that you've made it. You're interviewing even former president. Please, um, we need a job. Link us up. I'm like, dude, like I don't even have a job myself. You know, I don't have a job. How can I, how can I, how can I even link you up for you to get, you know, I don't have a job myself. Yeah. It's, and I mean, well, that's true, huh? This is literally what I'm trying to, the message I'm trying to give to the world. Like the misery mantra is to chase your dreams whilst living your best life. What is it that you are passionate about? And why don't you just champion in that? Instead of like, you know, one of my and Darlington said, finding a job or just because your mother, your parents have, you know, told you, I want you to be a doctor, I want you to be this. Do whatever it is that you're passionate about. And when you focus on that, definitely you'll be able to, to survive. I talked about, um, when I did a video with Maya, people who look down on jobs, the watch seller who makes 4K, 4K in about six hours. When somebody is, that is somebody's, that's somebody's two month salary in Ghana. But they would rather sit in an office and, you know, be a PA or whatever, have a long fancy title, but they're not getting half as much as the local coconut seller, watch seller or car washer. Yeah. So I definitely feel like the diaspora needs to come as the Africans in mm -hmm. the diaspora, we can unite with Africa if we come back and start opening up businesses over here. We start creating jobs for the Ghanaians or for the people in your country, in back home, wherever you are. That way, we'll be able to... And it's not going to be easy, 1,000%, because they are very much stuck in their ways. And I do feel in yeah. Ghana they don't like change. But once you keep going, you keep going, you keep pushing, there will be that breakthrough. Yeah. That's it. It's 
just about being persistent and not giving up. Gotcha. And I, I, I would also say that uh, sometimes I would say, most of the time it depends on like how this saying goes that charity begins at home. You know, how we were brought up, uh, most of us that was brought, us, uh, brought up back home, right? Let's say you live in Ghana and that uh, you're, you know, your you're upbringing and stuff like that. Your parents keep putting in your head that if you don't become a doctor, if you don't become a lawyer, if you don't become, let's say, uh, some some fancy job or do some fancy job as a career, you probably not make it in life or your 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 life is gonna go into shambles and stuff like that. So would you kind of like agree with me that the way we were brought up or I'll say the ideology that our parents gave to us as we we're growing up made us feel that, okay, if I get to America, if I get to the UK, I've made it. Though, well, what is it? 100%, 100%. Your something to say oh my daughter she's a lawyer oh you didn't know my daughter or my my son he's a banker but right now i feel like they're slowly understanding or grasping the fact that mm -hmm. it's not even about that anymore like i mean i mean in regards to and i agree with you what you're saying drew but in regards to that particular question you have to understand where they are coming from in in their time and in that era that was the thing being a exactly. doctor, being an engineer, being a lawyer was the thing. Those were the people that were making the money. So every parent's idea or what they wanted their, their, their idea um, child, what they wanted their child to become was to be that doctor. So she can say, my, do my daughter, my son is a doctor. My son is an engineer. My son, um, daughter is an engineer, pilot, yeah. whatever. It was, it was a status thing. But exactly. as they moved on, things changed. The world has changed completely. Um, Thank you. And, um, the ultimate bottom line is what you're saying is they just wanted you to know that if my son is an engineer, automatically it's money. But you can also give money, the same amount of money, doing something else. And it is sad that that is the way that they were brought, that Listen, they were brought up. I have, I have gotten the opportunity to meet Indians and people from different backgrounds that are not into medicine. They are not into engineering. They're just data analysts by yeah. watching youtube and learning on now and they are making equivalent to what doctors are making right now the world is changing and and within a short period of time technology has moved so fast that it has changed the game for everyone it, it the person that is able to tap into technology right now is going to make it you yeah. have to be able to utilize the platform i know people that don't even have bachelor's degree but are making close to what doctors or even more than what doctors are making yeah. making more than what yeah. necessary making. i remember when i first came to this country when I first came to the States and, um, you know, my mom, I went out with my mom, you know, meeting my mom's friends and they said, oh, they're like, oh, you know, you should go do nursing, nurse money, nurse. And I'm like, nursing, like I have no interest in it. There are people that have interest in it. It's wonderful. People, nurses, I, listen, we salute you guys, especially during this season where you're saving <laughs> our lives. But it's not for everyone. And it's like, it's like, it's like an easy entrance. Everyone feels like, and when you come here first, it's like it's an easy entrance because you know, you, you're coming from a background where you, 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 you know you have science background, whatever. They feel like you have to jump into that. It's going to be easy for you. But it's yeah. not so. You have to pursue your passion. And in doing so, you'll be able to achieve great things and build things that will benefit everyone. You, whatever you're doing has to be a service. It's not yeah. just about the money. Because when you follow the services, the money comes to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. And I would say uh, with your example that you just gave, I think it's kind of like a typical example of a... Uh, I'll tell you what Maya and uh, Ms. Drew on here, because I'll say they're back back home because uh, following the service, kind of like what Maya giving the service to Africa, going to the different countries and uh, you know taking the videos and stuff and showing it to the world as to how great Africa is, as how people would think that Africa, quote unquote, quote unquote, I repeat again, quote unquote, that we live on trees, we live in the jungle, and then he's showing the other side of Africa, knowing that okay, there are great resorts here, there are great places on here. Ms. Drew doing her videos, you know, showing that okay, hey. There are great places that you can actually come visit and know that, you know, um, it's a great place that you can actually visit in Ghana. Like the initiative that happened last year, I couldn't get the chance to come, which is the uh, year of return, yeah. right? A lot of people coming in and actually seeing that uh, Ghana, quote unquote, is not the place that they thought it was. You know, looking at, you know, how the resorts, uh, Aqua Safari, uh, the, all the other big, big resorts in Ghana and, you know, in the diaspora, I would say in Ghana as well, made it, I, I would say, an eye opener for them to actually know that, okay, Africa is a place that I can actually come in and visit or invest in because I see bigger things happening there that people are actually doing something bigger with themselves as compared to us sitting here and thinking that, oh, if I go do this in Africa, it's not going to yield anything for me. Because if I'm coming to invest in your, one thing that I saw was um, uh, you interviewed a guy who deals in, I think, the solar panels. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, he was stating that even though, though, like I said in the beginning, that 
we need each other. We need the whites. We need the black. We need the Caucasians. We need the uh, Dominicans. You know, all those people. He started with this, I would say, was he in the States or the UK? One of them. And he moved to Ghana to start, you know, the solar panel business and stuff like that. And he still has investors who are white, investors who are black, investors who are, you know, different colored of people who are still coming in to invest. And knowing that this is something that would actually improve, let's say, a long term investment. 10 years from now, okay, Ghana will probably invest more into solar panels because we know that that's going to save a lot of money, a lot of costs on our side, right? And to draw to the next question, it's more like I was stating with the family, you know, charity beginning at home. Um, like Nima was saying that when he got here, his mother was like, um, oh, if you become a, a nurse, you know, that would help because nurses are making money. Let, yes, it did start from their time where um, they were more so of, oh, if you're a doctor, you've made it in life. If you're a lawyer, you've made it in life. You know, if you're this, you've made it in life. I went through the same exact thing. When I got here, my mom was like, oh, you should be um, a doctor. I was like, eh, no, I don't want to be sleeping and wait. They call me at 2 a.m. in the morning that, hey, we have a, uh, what do you call it, emergency. You have to come to the hospital. Like, whatever is going on in, within COVID and stuff like that. So I told her that, mom, just give me the free time. I would decide on what I want to do by myself at my own time, my own pace. So at the end of the day, when I went to her, I was like, okay, mom, I think what I actually want to do is dive into the IT industry, right? To actually do stuff, because I feel like that's where my calling is. That's what I want to do besides what I do on the side. So at the end of the day, it actually did work for her. So like you were saying that as time goes on, they did understand that, okay, it's not all about being a doctor, right? It's not all about being a nurse. It's not all about being, you know, this white color, nice job making six figures a year. And one, one typical example that I have with that, um, there was this friend doctor of mine, right? And uh, he goes to work, right? He goes to work, he works 12 hours. Like he, he goes uh, seven to seven, seven to seven. And then he closed from work one day, he was coming back home and he stopped at the traffic light. So he stopped at the traffic light and then, you know, the light turned green, he was not moving. The car was not moving. And they, you know, they went to the car and they were like, hey, hey, are you okay? They opened the door, he's, he's dead, he's gone. Literally, he's dead and gone. And, you know, that's not even the sad part. After they did the autopsy, right, in the States here, after they did the autopsy, they figured that it was pressure on him. It's kind of like high blood pressure and stuff like that. So I'm not going to say it's basically from the career that he had, but based off of the experience that I will say I've seen some of my friends go through, I'll say with the pressure that he had from here kind of like amounted to him having that, you know, high blood pressure on his side. Because if, let's say, like me and Newman say we're going to Ghana. If we come to Ghana, the freedom is there. You know, you don't have to think about waking up early in the morning and having to clock uh, clock in or having to go to meetings and stressing out and thinking about, you know, oh, Charlie, my boss is going to kill me if I don't log in at this time. My boss is going to kill me if I don't at that time. So drawing to the entrepreneurship aspect of it, if let's say we decide to, uh, Africans in the diaspora decide to come to Ghana to actually educate and build like what the Maya was saying, right? If the infrastructure like is not set in place, by, I would say, quote unquote, I might be wrong, set in place by the government, right? Which we have actually put in power to actually help us with that. If it's not set in place to actually help us who want to be entrepreneurs to move back home, if we move to us, we feel like, okay, we're coming back to literally nothing and they're not actually on time. They're not actually following the steps or the ways that I want them to follow to help me help them. Do you get my point? So if I you're not helping me help you, then at the end of the day, I feel like, okay, then me coming back home is not going to do anything for me. Do you get my point? We still want to do it, you know, but then, like, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Darlington. We still want to help out. I think, I think Ms. Drew has an answer because she's, she's no, excited to answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm getting what you were saying, but I'm not. You, we cannot wait for the government. You shouldn't mm -hmm. wait for the government. You need, you know, you need to start you know, now. All, but, all the people that... Drew, go ahead. Go ahead. So I was that you have to start now it's not going to be easy but you shouldn't be thinking if you're not going to help me then i'm not going to help you so i'm just going to stay where i am and just watch you guys go into fall into absolute nothing no you still have to continue because it's like you you said it yourself small drops of water make a whole river people will mm -hmm. catch on and once maybe you can see the dent that you're making in the society then maybe you'll get the you know attention of the government maybe and then they can help out i mean they already saw that every december People from around the world were coming to Ghana in December before. Then they decided to jump on the wave and create year of return. But we were already returning before the government even spoke about it. Afro Nation was booked before it was announced this is going to be the year of return. So okay. we definitely start doing what we're doing first. And then later on, 
if they jump on great if they don't still keep doing it because we'll be able to make a change and then you will be the one that will be recognized for it then the government taking over and saying oh yes take all the glory and say it's for them because that's in a way technically what has happened people are doing things already then as soon as the, jump, the government jump on they just steal the idea and then they get all the praise and all your hard work goes down to nothing well wow. okay yeah we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't need the government um, as an African diaspora coming back to Africa, mm -hmm. like I would say that Africa is not perfect. You know how Africa was when you left. So you coming back, you have to come back with an idea of you coming to add value to what is going on. Okay. What change are you bringing in? Let, let, let me tell you something. When you come to Africa, you might see opportunities that me that I've never traveled out of Africa, I wouldn't say. You will come and tell me that, hey, I think we can do this. We have this in the West. I think yeah. you see, I have a friend who um, you know we live in, when we live in China, we used to order food within one minute we get our food, dispatches and all that, but we can trace where our food is. okay? So this guy was based in China. When he came to Ghana, he realized that when he order food, you don't know where the dispatcher is. They will tell you 15 minutes, 10 minutes, they end up coming 20 minutes later. So what yeah. this did was to design an app to trace. Like if, if let's say, I order a food, he would trace where the dispatcher is. He would mm -hmm. trace it to my house, like an yeah. Uber. You order an Uber, you will know where the Uber driver is, five mm -hmm. minutes, three minutes. You see, like you brought a change that was not there. Mm -hmm. see, we have to join hands together and bring that change that Africa is looking for, not mm -hmm. always depending on the government, because they are not willing to help. They are not willing to change anything. We mm -hmm. all know African politics is all about pocket. Yo, you're my friend, you're my brother. Let's do it this way and we are done. Like, can you imagine, like, people are building houses, mansions, go to Tema, community, oh, yeah. where Drew is, uh, community 13, 12, people are building houses, but the road is nothing to write home about. Why? Mm -hmm. Because people are waiting for the government. And if you do the road by yourself too, I think they're gonna sue you or something. You can't do the road. <laughs> you can't do the road yourself. Wow. So okay. people wow. invest in houses. So there's nothing you can do. You 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 can't wait for the government because this is the problem of Africa. Mm -hmm. You always want to wait for the government to do something. Oh, what is the government doing? Like, let's talk about the project that brought Africa to the world, changing mm -hmm. the narratives of Africa. Mm -hmm. We all have been seeing how people see Africa. It's the responsibility of the tourism board to come out and say that enough is enough. Let's mm -hmm. start talking about Africa in a positive way. But mm -hmm. they're not doing that. It has to be YouTubers to come up and say that enough is enough. So okay. as an African, just okay. always have the idea that I must play a role to change the face of Africa by not depending on the government. Do your yeah. own thing at your own time. And Africans will be proud of you. Oh, great, great. That was, um, Maya, that's wonderful. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm very pro government. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm, right? I'm, 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 You're a politician, yeah? He's a politician. I'm very pro government. Um, in terms of in terms of um, politics or in terms of government, I when it comes to Africa, we have to come to the understanding that I'm I'm, I'm also a very strong Christian. Um, mm. the Bible says that the youth will have vision and the older folks will dream dreams. We have to come to the understanding that our leaders are usually old. Our president is currently in the 70s. They're dreaming. They're, 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 what they want to do is dreams that they had, visions that they had in the past. Now those things are dreams and they mm. can't accomplish it. Yet again, that's why, that's why I always encourage a lot of youth to get involved in politics. And yeah. politics is actually for the youth to do. When you look yeah. into great nations, when you look into um, um, America, and there were a lot of people in their founding fathers that were young. Thomas Jefferson was young when he, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. When you go to Great Britain, what's the name? Um, Will, William Wilberforce, when he started the fight for the abolition of slave trade, he was 24 years old. He achieved it in his late 40s. Mm -hmm. That should tell you that when we're young, we are vibrant, we have the energy, we can do it. And most young folks need to get involved. Never be discouraged by um, the older folks saying that you don't respect. Because we like to, they like to do that. They say, oh, I'm the father of the nation. No, don't do that. We need to get more younger folks 
involved and engaging in, 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 in politics. Okay, now moving forward. Um, there's this saying um, that um, one guy said, he said, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page. So Maya, you've traveled the world. Um, Drew, you've been to UK. I'm sure you've been to other places also. You've experienced from different parts of the world. So now when you go home, you notice things and you're like, hmm, I can implement this back home, which can help in the development of my people. Because the goal is to learn from different places. And when we learn from different places, we bring it back home to build it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of folks, in terms of the diaspora, we need a lot of young folks coming back home. Mm -hmm. just, just because of this, because they have had an encounter with um, and different people. They have had the experience of seeing different things. Um, when, in terms of our leaders, yes, we have leaders that travel. But when they go, when they travel to different parts of the world, they see the surface things, they see the roads, they see the tall buildings. That's all they think about. But they don't see the small, small things that make impact. They don't see the small businesses. Like when you come to America, when you come to New York, for instance, people will think like, oh, JP Morgan or those big businesses are the ones that are holding New York. No, it's the small businesses within New York, the corner store, the deli. Those businesses make New York what New York is. So when our world leaders, when our African leaders come, they don't go to the deli. They don't go to Walmart to go and see the um, reverse vending machine that people go and send bottles back to do that. We are the ones doing it because we, we're schooling here. We're seeing all of this. We're, we, we're like, okay, these are things that people are implementing, which is helping in terms of recycling, a recycling culture. Every year we experience flooding in Ghana. Every year we experience flood in Ghana. And then we complain that it is due to plastic materials clocking our sewages. So then what do we do? We have to create a culture of recycling where people start to recycle some of these plastic materials. And then it's become part of us, which will reduce. Yes, it might not completely get rid of the flooding because obviously our sewer systems are not good. Our roads are not good. But it will reduce those flooding. It will reduce the yearly flooding happening. So um, I feel like we should definitely... Um, encourage folks to go back home mm -hmm. due to the fact that they have encountered different backgrounds and um, experienced different backgrounds, talk to different people, acquire different knowledge. Um, I went to a seminar one time and, and the guy said, folks that go back home, one, you have international experience, you have international certificates. And he said, one, it was, a th it was three things. And, and, and with that, when you go, you have that opportunity to do well. Mm -hmm. We have that opportunity to do well. We have to jump on it. Yes, it's privilege. But we have to jump on it to help our people. Mm -hmm. Of course, definitely. But then what you were saying about, you know, the government and being involved with the government is all well and good saying that, yes, as a diaspora or as young people, we should join the government. We should have our voices. But it's no, not I'm as not easy. Saying, I'm, not, I'm not saying join them. We're not <laughs> joining them, but well, that's how it came across, actually. It was, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm saying I'm pro-government. I'm pro-government. Pro yes. I feel like... There has to be a system that holds everyone. You understand? Oh, yes. There has to be something accountability has to be there. The young people and the older people can come together, drop their, their drop their ideas, and they can have a pool about it and talk about it. But the way things are right now is very there's a huge gap. The government and the old people are here and the young people here, but there's nothing in the middle that is bridging us together for us to be able right. to get our ideas to them and so they're very much stuck is a very much of a who you know or what family you were in and that's that's how it is and how much money you have so me coming from london trying to book an appointment with with at least kafuado's pa what who are you you're just a random mob with like it would take more than a thousand steps then again starting yourself and it's going to be hard because definitely the Recycling is a thing that has been bugging me for ages. I mean, in London, if you don't recycle, you get fined. But in Ghana, when you're getting a simple fan, you'll go, they give you a, a clear plastic plus a black bag for no reason. They love it. It's frustrating. In terms of recycling, I actually did a survey in Ghana in um, 2017, talking to different people different uh, from different backgrounds. And there was this one lady I spoke to, and she said in the past, she used to like to recycle. She would separate plastic stuff from regular garbages. And, mm -hmm. and she said, she said, when the Bola people come, that's how she used it. When the garbage, um, garbage collectors come, they just dump everything in one place. And to her, she was like, okay, it's a waste of time. And also um, there were folks that also said they do recycle, but what happened, especially with recycling of plastic bottles, what happened is during the hot season, during the hot season, when, because people drink a lot of water, 
and they do the recycling and they go to these manufacturing companies, these collectors, they pay them less because they assume that there are a lot of people drinking water so they can get it anywhere. And during the, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the rainy season, obviously, not a lot of people drink water, so they pay a little bit higher. But what happens is if Parliament is able to create a standard price, meaning they are taxing those bottles, and when you return the bottle, you are supposed to be getting back what you have, it will encourage people to do more of recycling. It will encourage people, because at, in the U.S., for instance, when you go to the, the store and you buy your bottle, you're actually taxed for the, 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 bottle, the water you're buying. But when you go back and you're taxed the same amount, when you go back and you return in the reverse vending machine, they give you that tax that was taxed on the bottle. You get it back. You get your money back. So you see all these, you see some Chinese folks, you see some folks that go around people's houses when it's time for recycling, when people put it outside, they go and they pick it up from the garbage. Because they use that money, they go back, return it, and they use that money to see their children to university. They people what, are what, actually not to, cut you off, not to cut you off. I thought there was something like that going on in Ghana. Whereas I'm not sure if you guys remember, but then if you go to buy, let's say, a crate of Coke, right? Uh, you pay for the bottles, or they'll tell you that you see that you pay for the bottles, so you return the bottles, and then they give yeah. you. I think, yeah, I think it was it was done in the past, but now how many people um, sell Coke bottles? Usually, it's cans. Oh. Or yeah. plastic bottles now compared to the past. Because I remember in the past when you, you you're going to buy coke, you're holding your basket, mm -hmm. and the coke is in the basket. You cover, you go, and you when you you have to return it to get your um to buy. It's, it's like that. It was in the past, but now it's no longer. There's no longer in our culture anymore. They still do it. They still do. Main big events. They still do. You still the option is there. Okay, okay that's so basically in reference to actually um. Uh, like I would say, uh, besides the fact that we need uh, Africans in the diaspora to actually move home or to, you know, either I would say not move home specifically or come to actually help uh, build Africa to where it needs to be. You know, like we're talking about with entrepreneurship as to if, if, you, have, if you have any ideas as to what you could do business wise back home or to actually impact the country you're from or, you know, Africa as a continent. Do you think people not doing that or people not actually doing that the most would be because of a disconnect that's actually having them think that, okay, if I go home, it's either A, B, or C is going to happen. If I go home, one, like the people would say, ah, if I go home, they would say every man for himself. One, one example that um, I would say, I spoke to this man that works at the, uh, what's your Flagstaff house in Ghana, right? I picked, uh, he works for the HR office in Flagstaff house. They hire, you know, the people to work for them, right? But then he was talking about the fact that, okay, why is it that in Ghana, whenever a new, and I know Newman, is, uh, sorry, Newman is going to go off on me on this one. Why is it that whenever a new president comes on, right, all the uh, members of parliament or, or a section of the parliament, he brings his own people. It's kind of like, okay, I am. You mean, the you mean ministers? Yeah, the ministers. When, when I'm president, I bring my own ministers. You are, and you, I'm not going to mention, you are, let's say you are QCP. Okay, and, a, and, and QC was on. A was on, right? And A is going. A needs to take all its people away. And now B is coming. B brings all its people. Do you think it would be better if, let's say, right, we have some sort of, um, if we are in a democracy, right, wouldn't you think it would be better to have, let's say, this section of people where, okay, we have to have a certain number of people from this particular party and this particular party to come together to make sure that the, that the ideas are actually being shared among ourselves rather than it being shared among one party? Um, in terms, in terms of governance, in terms of governance, I mean, we have three, three governors, and we have legislature, we have yeah. executive, and we have judiciary. When it comes to the executive, in terms of legislature, is the people that vote for that parliament mm -hmm. as well as parliament. But when it comes to executive, we are voting for the president, and any person, any minister in the presence uh, uh, with the president has to be selected by the president. That is loyalty. You need loyalty. You okay. need people, people you think can get the job done. And the president has every right to choose his staff. Mm -hmm. it, it is right. It's, it's like it's like if I start a business, I start a business. You're not going to tell me um, because you used to run that business. Okay, let's say you used to run that business, right? And I mm -hmm. come in and I'm like, I buy your business. You're not going to tell me that I should stick with your workers. One, your workers are already loyal to you. And your workers know you, they'll, they'll, they'll work for you, whatever. But it's more so who do I trust? Who do I know can get the job done? You trusted them. You feel they were going to get the job done for you. But I have to also look into consideration who can get the job done for me. Yes, during Kufour's time, Kufour um, had um, this guy. This guy, what's his name? He's been running for president for a long time. I'm trying to remember his name again. Um, he's from Cape Cod. Pakistan Doom. Kufour had Pakistan Doom as a, as a member, uh, as a minister. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's possible. People do it. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of having one party here yeah, um, joining your cabinet, no, it's not encouraged. It's not advisable. But um, it all depends on the president at that time. He chooses mm -hmm. his cabinet. Okay. He chooses the staff. Mm -hmm. and, but when it comes to parliament, the people choose their member of parliament. So it all boils down to who you want to lead you. Because at the end of the day, Member and um, parliament has a lot of power. People tend to forget it in Africa. We always look to the president. If there's light off, we say the president. But we have to understand that parliament has a lot of power. We need to start making them accountable and reducing all the burden on the president. Because when you go to, um, I remember, um, recently, um, not to undermine any leader, I'm not going to mention names, some parts of Ghana, the worst were terrible. And I was talking to, I was talking to one of my friends, and the person said, Ah, the Albania also is our party. So, so <laughs> the, point, the point is, they don't, don't want to vote that person out of office because the person is a party member, is he's, he's in our party, so we can't vote the person out. You understand? Yeah. But it shouldn't be so. You have to hold the person accountable. And when the person was held accountable, people started asking questions. He, the person, the person said, "Is the DCE that is responsible for developmental projects?" No. Yes, it's yes, but no. You, as a member of parliament, have influence. You are able to go and sit at the table and have discussions in terms of what developmental projects can be done in your place. You can lobby for money. You can lobby for projects to be done in your constituency. Members of parliament have a lot of, they have immense power. They have immense power. We have to hold them accountable. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, he said, he said you can't be for your consistency and you can't be for just your area. But the reality of the situation is that's what's happening. It's yeah. a little bit. That like you, I, I think I agree with Albert that you know if someone is in power, there should be a little bit of people here. Because imagine all of the buildings. If you come to Ghana, there are actually quite a few unfinished buildings that are just sat there because oh, it was a product of the past government. And if it keeps going like that, then we're just gonna have a whole load of unfinished buildings, unfinished roads, unfinished thingies that these governments are trying to do, and I it's mean, not gonna help us move forward as I a country. Mean, one thing, one thing, A plus, A plus. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with A plus. And one thing a lot of people have been pushing for is a national agenda. When there's a national agenda, the goal is that whether NDC, CPP, MPP, whoever is on, in power, whatever project they started, the next administration must be able to complete those projects. The thing about African leadership is that when um, Party A comes into office, they want to do their project and say, we did this. Mm -hmm. And they get a claim. Like, let's use our beautiful airport, for instance. I will, I will say NDC did well. I am going to, um, I don't like Mahama. I, I don't like Mahama, I'll say. Um, but um, Mahama did very well. We have to acknowledge that. We have to appreciate the effort he put in in making our airports look good. Um, um, yes, MPP, people, think, people tend to say, oh, it's do Nanado, Nanado did it. But then it's Mahama, let's be real. But mm -hmm. the, point, the point is, where, when we have a national agenda, now there's a goal. Now there's a purpose. Whether A or B comes into office, we know there's going to be a completion of that project that was started. We have to come to that. That's one thing A plus has been pushing for, and I and I appreciate him for pushing for that because one of the things I believe in is a mm -hmm. national agenda. Wonderful. And not to not to deviate from our topic since we have a few minutes left. Um. So uh, with all the ideas that was actually talked about here today, right? What just just suggestion wise, right? What do we? What do you guys think would be some of the things that we can actually put in place? Because we could keep talking about, you know, ideas, you know, we should do this, entrepreneurs should do that, you know, Africans in the diaspora should do this, they should do that. But then I would say, um, um, if you have a vision without action, it's kind of like you're just running in waters, like you don't know what you're doing. So what, are, what do you think are some steps that we could take? Let's forget about, um, I would say, the, uh, the older folk. Let's forget about those who are actually, let's say, in government. Yes, we do need them. It is totally understandable. But us as millennials who are actually, I would say, growing to take up that space, us as millennials who are actually, you know, jeering towards actually that stage of our lives where we want to actually see Africa to be a better place. Because uh, this has been something that has been going on for years, for decades. People wanting to put Africa uh, uh, on the map, put people wanting to put Africa where it should be and stuff. What do you think are some steps that as millennials could take to actually make our countries, our specific countries, and Africa as a continent you know, no, uh, um, where we want to see it. Because right now I would say that it's the ball is in our court, right? We can't say that we're relying on the government because one, they, they just, it's kind of like every man for himself in the government, go for asshole. 
right? So if we want to change, we have to put into action. So what are some ideas that you guys think can be put in place to help us millennials upcoming to actually help us make Africa or the continent a better place? Any but ideas? Like you said, start, start from start small from ideas. Start with your, exactly like what the man said, start with yourself. The smallest thing is, could be, see how Uber came to Ghana and now it's just blown. Little things like that that are you are seen as small, small things outside. But, 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 but Uber, 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 Uber had the capital. Uber, Uber had capital. The point, our problem is capital, man. It's capital. It's all about money. It's, just it's, be, it's all about be, money and... But see, that, that, is, that, is the, that is the mindset that we have that everything has to do with money. But even mm -hmm. if you don't have the money, so far as you have the plan, you will always have people to push the agenda. I, um, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, what I'm saying is that so have, 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 have the plan. Have the example. Have the, have, have, example. <laughs> Go ahead. Have, the, have the plan. And then when you are ready to implement it, there are people who are going to come and support you to implement the plan that you have. Like I said, you shouldn't wait. The time is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's time for the youth of Africa to grab all the opportunities in Africa. I have seen it myself. I'm a living testimony because I have seen people who are doing it. I've seen people who use their school fees to establish factories. I've seen people who don't even want to appear on camera. They are doing fantastic jobs on the continent. And they are just like you and I. It's all, it's all about the capital. It's all about starting from somewhere. And if you think yeah. you have a vision that, okay, you can't do this alone, then you look for people who are willing to support that dream to make it into. So, um, so one thing I want, I want to say mm -hmm. is that uh, this number is, um, is very important, is that we need to know that um, roughly about 35 million citizens of African descent reside in the U.S. alone. Yeah. And collectively, we have a purchasing power of about $450 billion. Wow. If all of this money is summed up, this can represent a single country. And that will make us 15 largest, um, um, in terms of one of the 15 largest countries or like 15 um, richest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. so, so we do have the purchasing power. Nigeria alone has a huge purchasing power. Um, whatever business you intend to do, if you start small, as they've mentioned, you can you can do it. You just have to, even if you don't have the capital, you have to find ways to be able to do that business where it's not capital intensive for you. There are a lot of ways. There are a lot of ways. Um, um, social media has made it so easy. I see a lot of folks, young ladies, um, young ladies, young men, whatever, selling wigs and yeah. selling whatever. They're doing it and it's working. I know a lot of folks that are shipping clothes from different parts of the world into africa and it's working they are doing it it is a gradual process entrepreneurship has been an african thing from the beginning even in our declaration of independence and um, ghana's declaration of independence kwame kuma makes makes mention of the market movement the impact they play the role they play and what they are going to continue to do because market women those women in makola and katamatsu those women are making money they are, they are, they are they'll be holding they'll be holding ghana Yes, they've been holding Ghana down for a long time, and we need to appreciate them. <laughs> you might, you might think that you might think that they are not. You might think that it's like, oh, hustler's job. They are just going back and forth. those women have been holding Ghana down for a long time. It is not those huge companies you see and all those things. It is those market women, and that yeah. shows that if we also start getting dirty, we need to get dirty. We need to get in that mud and work our ass off, and not be thinking about white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, and just trying to like be fancy there are a lot of hustling jobs i know and i have friends that are um and um, chefing doing chef stuff and they are, they are they are they're selling stuff on the street pineapple and there's one friend that is doing kinky kinky something where they make ice cake and they sell there are people that are all these opportunities are there we have to go outside of the box and forget government jobs and those white color jobs and focus on the hustle Yes, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. I say that all the time. But we also mustn't actually, as much as I'm very much pro, you know, chase your passion, do what it is that you are passionate about. We mustn't forget that all these other jobs, they still need people to work them. So oh, we have to, we, they still need people to work them. And so we have to also be able to adapt the mindset that honestly, I've learned the hard way. You cannot be in Ghana and feel like you can survive on one job. You cannot. Oh, no. On the whilst you are, you know, 
working, doing your, your maybe your five to nine or nine. You'll be doing a side time hustle, which is, you know, creating, adding the small, small pennies that you might be getting towards the, something small that can be helping on large, helping yes. the country, helping, large, helping the country as a whole, because things like that will be able to help us move faster. Right. And that, just to just to put out the last points before you know I, I leave everybody alone. I, I did see that Ms. Drew has also started like you know your own entrepreneurship with the plantain chips, right? Um, <laughs> with, a, with the plantain chips, uh, you started you know your own uh, business with the plantain chips. How is that going for you? And kind of like if somebody's on here watching us and actually wants to start something, you know, in Ghana, as well, let's say registering a business putting you know, stuff out there, making sure they have these ideas. And because I think now everything is like on Instagram, on Facebook, they put everything on there and then they get the buyer. Instagram, Instagram businesses actually survive more in Ghana than actual buildings. Instagram yeah. buildings, I've realized Instagram businesses are flourishing right now. Mm -hmm. But it's different because in the UK, an Instagram business isn't really that popular. Everybody wants to go into the shop and, um, you know, buy feel and touch and all that kind so of thing. But what are some, some advices that you would give to somebody that actually wants to start something? Let's say not just in Ghana, but let's say Africa in general. Some of some of the hardship that you went through to actually get the business where you know where I know it's kind of like at the uh, stages where you know you starting off little by little, but then what are some of the challenges that you face that somebody can actually learn from if they actually want to do something back home? Firstly, I would definitely say research. You have to do the research in the market. You can't just wake up today and say, oh, yeah, I want to launch a pen line when you haven't seen all the types of pens that are already out there for you. You need to see what is on the market, how well it is doing, learn from it. This is what you have to You have to learn from, you know, what other people are doing. Start with sampling. You, to be fair, the first month is a lot of giving out for people to sample. Give them your reviews. Let, let's mm -hmm. see what people are saying um, before you're able to then build up of that. Um, so in Ghana, a lot of people do depend on public figure reviews, which is mm -hmm. one thing that I the hard way. You, if a celebrity has said that, oh yeah, this is good, or a credible source has said that this is good, then more people depend on that that way. Registering a business in Ghana, you need to pay a lot of money to register your business. You need to pay for, pay for, pay for FDA because I'm um, with the food, mine's with food. You have to pay for yeah, you have to pay for registering, make sure there's a certain amount um, acquired before the business can even be registered. So there's a lot of money that you have to put into it and you need to also be patient. So if you are passionate about what you are doing and you understand why you're doing it, then I'm telling you, all the hardships that come your way, the knocks, the dips, the hustles, the passion is what will fuel you. And when the money comes, it will, just, it will, it will be an added bonus because this mm -hmm. is something that you love. But I definitely, definitely would Im implore you guys to research. Research the market. See what's around. Sometimes I would say, you know, look at where the gap is in the market. But just because Amma is doing plantain chips and uh, Akria is also doing plantain chips, that doesn't mean that my plantain chips are not going to sell. Mm -hmm. Room for everybody. There is enough room for everybody to survive and to flourish and to, to grow in this community. So it's all about making yours unique what is it that is going to be your usp with your product gotcha. talking about, talk, talk about plantain chips and um, erasmus freeman says he wants to try your plantain chips so um not, not to cut so um this uh going to uh what Maya, right uh the question that i asked miss drew was she just started her own entrepreneurship with oh her wow i like the package I, I like the package. Oh. My package. You can open the packaging looks very good. You can resale. We give a certain percentage to the farmers um, that, that do the hard work. We only source from direct farmers. We don't get it from any random people in the market. We also make sure that we, our plantain chips don't use any fertilizers. So what's your USB? And to be fair, like I said, even though it's in Ghana, my head is for is thinking international. This is for this is supposed to be in Walmart. This is supposed to be in Tesco. This is supposed to be around the world, not just Ghana. And so we yeah. have two things. You can buy them online, guys. You can deliver to anywhere in the world. www.mensay.com. Sorry, I had to plug. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Let, let them know. Check us out on Instagram, Aiko, which means well done. So this was a, a present to myself saying, well done for surviving in Ghana for two years. And that's wow. why we plan to change. Uh, to to uh, what am I, right? Um, and I'll go to yeah. that in a bit. 
Um, what are some, since, let's say, uh, you have, I would say, traveled around Africa, right? Been to most of the countries in Africa, you know, Nigeria, Kenya, Cameroon, all those countries that I would say you've been to. What are some ideas that you would say? Because if we keep, like I said, if we keep talking about the fact that, oh, we have to invest in ourselves, start from ourselves. Uh, some of us here, like Ms. Drew was saying, would need to research and stuff like that. You have seen it firsthand. What are some advices that you would give business-wise? Let's say somebody wants to start a business, right? To help his, his or her country. Maybe they're not specifically from Ghana. Maybe they're from Uganda. They're from Kenya and stuff like that. What are some of the things that you've seen that, okay, if I think if you invest in this, I think if you actually uh, focus on this, research more on this aspect, let's say research more on solar panels, research more on A, B, C, on D, right? And I ask you this question because you have traveled more in the African diaspora as compared to, you know, I would say some of us, right? So what are some of the ideas that you would say would give to some of these people who are watching us who actually wants to start something uh, back home? So it's so it's so tough for me to tell right now because the yeah. opportunity is huge in Africa. Uh, but I would say that first of all, if you're an African and you live in Africa and you've not been to any other African country apart from your own country, shame on you. Um, uh, yeah, well, I used to be <laughs> Let me continue. Um, when I started traveling in Africa, I realized that we don't know each other, and I didn't even know that. Ghana and Togo has a lot in common. I never knew that Kenya and Tanzania has a lot in common. So you might from you might be from Ghana and see some opportunities in Kenya, yeah? And you'll be like, okay, this is not in Kenya, but this is in Ghana. Then you come and invest in that particular country. I met a man in, uh, in Ghana who owns offices. One is a one, uh, one airport square. I don't know anyone who knows one airport square. Um, he owns the eighth floor of one airport square. And this guy is from Kenya. So what he did was he, he established a business of renting out offices to people in Kenya. He's one of the successful businessmen in Kenya. But now he realized that when he went to West Africa, people were building their houses. Offices were not that much in West Africa. What he did was he bought the whole apartment, he bought the whole building and turned everything into offices. Mm -hmm. Now he owns it. You rent it and then you pay him. Now when you go there, there are so many offices at one place. This is an opportunity that he saw in Ghana and he decided to what? Invest in it. He did it in Ghana and Nigeria, right? Because in Kenya, it's everywhere. But when he went to Ghana, he realized that it's few. So he had to what, invest in it. So this is one of the reasons why you need to travel to other African countries to see what it's not in your country so that you'll be able to know what to invest in your country. Um, secondly, um, let me just say some of the things that we don't value on the continent is things that you can literally invest your money into. Share butter. Yeah. When Drew came to Africa, she has invested in plantain chips. Like, seriously? <laughs> I, invest in, I, I, I invest in plantain chips, plantain chips. I buy plantain chips for one city, two city. I, I, I'm, I'm done. But look at what Drew has done. I lived in Ghana. I never thought of that. Yeah. So let's talk about share butter. When you go to the north, there's this lady who is branding herself like a share butter queen. I'm a, I'm a mat. I'm a mat. Yeah. Who is creating a whole brand on its own but look at us like when we talk about share butter those days we thought that it's for poor people who can't afford to use this perfume creams and those are the people that are using share butter this is something that as a young african you can you know you don't even need money to start share butter business you don't need a lot of money because my my, my sister was working for somebody i did a video about uh, black soap when i did a video about black soap people were reaching out to me hey whoa i want to order this and the black soap the people actually sell it for five cities wow. mm -hmm. is it two kg or one kg they sell it for five cities and i told my sister hey me i don't have time okay i i I'm, i have so many things that i do so i think you can invest in it and then she started now she doesn't do anything all she does is like deliver black soap to the west and get the money it's selling dollars and you know selling in dollars and getting back changing them to Ghana City, that's a lot of money. Yeah. So I'm just telling young Africans who, let's say you, you you work in an office, you have eight to nine or eight to five job, please look at the basic things around you that we don't value as an African. Mm -hmm. Things that we don't value. These are the things that is like valuable in the West. But if you think you have a bigger picture of you being in real estate and if you don't have money, put people together. 
you can you can work with other people and start investing in it. There's a man who started real estate with a wife, and now they're one of the big guys in Ghana. So find partners if you think wow. that you cannot do it alone. Together we start divided, we fall. But I would say that please the greediness Wonderful. among Africans is way too much. So please, when you wanna like invest, please don't try to invest too much because you want to make more money. Yeah, so <laughs> basically that's that's all I can say. Look around you, look at the basic things around you and invest in it just like Drew. And um, don't think that it's just you have to go and stay in the office. That's when you're going to make money. I've been uh, blocked so many times, like my bank account, they thought I'd do 419. But I, I, I don't. I, I just like stay on the internet and then just see what I can do. And even there's an opportunity um, of selling t-shirts without even investing a dollar in it. Yeah. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Like you, can, you have so many applications on the internet so i would also encourage more africans watching me right now like the internet has become a place where with your smartphone you can literally make as much as money as you want without going anywhere just staying in your room you can um sell t-shirts online you can i mean there's so many uh, there, there's so many websites so yeah. many websites youtube is there facebook is also paying right now instagram is paying right now stop like I will encourage, like you know, Ghanaian youths, we are good at insulting bloggers. Mm -hmm. we, we insult bloggers as if they have nothing to do with their life. But sometimes I see people to be so stupid because you know what? Like you are paying money to to insult a blogger who is gonna make money from you insulting him or her. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 these are the things that is it, is miseducation. Like people will come and look at me, and then they'll be like, "Oh, have you always come and sit on the internet without doing nothing? You you quit your aeronautic job to do this? Oh, go look for a job, dude! Like really?" <laughs> so I feel like we need to start educating our own people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to start educating our own people. That is the only way because that's why anytime I get a chance and when I travel, I bring people together and I teach them what I know and I leave because yeah. I feel like we need to share what I learned in China. I feel like China made me who I am today. And I always say thank you, China, because I learned a lot. I, I had classmates from everywhere and I was learning, 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 learning. So literally, I work with my phone every yeah. day. That's it. That's all I know. I don't know anybody else. Wonderful. So I believe that whatever you know, like whatever you know, when you get opportunity, please share. Let's not be greedy and Wonderful. learn from ourselves and let's make it together. Wonderful. That's all I want to say. What about you, Darlington? What advices would you give to somebody out there as well? Um, just finish. <laughs> Do you want mine? <laughs> um, what uh, Maya said was the phones. Um, I mean, our phones are just right now. Everything is here. We can we can make wealth. We can do everything. Brick and mortar and um, businesses are not doing so well, especially during this time and um, this coronavirus season. And um, Instagram is paying very well. If you have a business on Instagram, it is going to pay you. And um, you are not. There's not a lot of cost involved in establishing businesses and. And marketing it on social media. I actually have a friend in the beginning of the year, he started a clothing line and he was using social media, that's Instagram. And he started with like less than a thousand followers. Now this guy has about 20 something thousand followers. Hmm. You know? And he says he sells, I had a conversation, he sells, he like he delivers all the way to up, up north to Kumasi and he lives in Accra. Wow. He doesn't do anything. He's doing delivery all over the country and he's wow. doing well, you know? Wow. Um, and fun fact, the clothes he's selling are all false, you know. Second, yeah. Yeah. But people are buying it because he's branded <laughs> it so well. I'm being real. He has branded it so well. Yes, there's second hand clothes, but he has branded it so well and he's making money out of it. He's doing well because yeah. he saw a service he could provide and he jumped on it. Or not everyone that is going to go to um Katamatu and go and do bend down boutique or whatever. Now yeah. you have to brand this all about branding. Yes, branding this over and it's making money out of it. In terms of my advice, my, my advice is mainly for um, folks in the diaspora. Um, we need to go home. Yeah. I it is something I have been preaching for a long time. Um, when we, it, 
oh god let me finish <laughs> <laughs> i need to come home it is something i am working towards the thing about i have noticed about a lot of diasporas coming home is that it's taking that leap of faith and if you find it difficult to take that leap of faith what you should do is to try to create a cushion for yourself create an environment that will be conducive so when you come back home it makes it easier for you to flow it is never so it will you you people say that and they take forever to come back but if you want to take your time do that but if you want to go on there are a lot of opportunities back home for each one of you come back home like let's go home let's go do it yes it's going to be difficult in the beginning but we have to hustle we have to do it if we don't do it Who's going to do it for us? Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to a friend of mine in the past, and he said, um, we were talking about parents, why our parents did not go back home when they, had, when they came to experience America and everything. And I told, I told that person that it is because they wanted a future for their children. It is understandable. They wanted a great future for their children. Like my mom came here. She said, oh, I need to bring my children here. They wanted that greener pastures for their children. But if we're constantly doing that, saying that, America is where it is, or UK is where it is, or the um, Western world, or um, Asia, China, for example, is where it is. What are we doing about our home? We need to come back home, build it, and say, yes, we are building it for the, our children. We're building the future for our children. We need to have that mindset. It's a, it's a mindset. And now, coming back to Ghana, and in terms of changing our culture, we have to start creating systems. We have to create um, a system that is going to be more of um, public engagement, public education. We'll be educating people in different industries, different ideas, different cultures, like giving them different cultures, how to like look into different business, how to mm -hmm. like, um, 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 in terms of like timing, going late, like change people's mindset about timing. It's important. It's all about public engagement. Public engagement is very important. Um, like um, when, I, when I started working in New York City, I used to work in an office which was called a public engagement unit. And that office, what they could do within New York alone is massive because we, we someone can literally be sitting in the office just doing phone calls and just doing public engagement, mm -hmm. engaging with the public. Um, what is your problem? All of that, we could we could go into the streets, you know, all those music they'll be playing, making advertisement or marketing or whatever. We yeah. could do the same where we're on the street playing music. And then engaging with the public, the market women, in terms of whether it's recycling or whatever knowledge or something we want to teach them, we need to start doing it. The government needs to invest a lot in public education, not just, oh, we have a project or like they want to just um, advertise whatever project they are doing on, their, on TV or social media. We need to start educating our people on how to build the country. That oh, is right. what I believe in. Thank you. And that is Thank advice. You. Thank you. And without wasting any of your time, I just want to thank everybody. Thank Ms. Drew, Wadamaya for taking the time, Darlington for taking the time to actually have this conversation with us today. I really appreciate all of you being here and all our viewers. I really appreciate you guys being with us uh, throughout the entire uh, conversation. I do hope that you did learn something from it because I know I did learn and I hope everybody else did learn something from it as well. And uh, we're going to see you guys again and we're going to have another conversation very soon. But till we see you guys again, stay blessed, be blessed and God bless. Thank you guys so much. We're out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys.